In this video, I'm going to show you how you can replace your VPN with a Zero Trust Access Solution. I just did it for my home lab, and the setup took all of 10 minutes. Now I have secure remote access to my NAS, Plex server, even things running in my cloud accounts and Kubernetes cluster, no matter where I am. I'll show you how I have all this set up in a minute, but first you may be asking, what is Zero Trust Access and how is it different from a traditional VPN? Zero Trust Access is a security model that provides secure access to network resources based on the principle of never trust, always verify. Zero Trust Access enforces granular access controls, limiting users to only the resources they need, reducing the attack surface and enhancing overall security. Now there's a lot of different solutions out there for enabling Zero Trust Access to your network, but the solution that I'm using is TwinGate. And I know what I said sounded a little bit complicated, but it's actually really easy to implement. And that's one of my favorite features of using a solution like TwinGate. And TwinGate is actually the sponsor of this video. I would like to thank them for sponsoring this video. I've been using their solution for about a month now, and I really like it. It has all the features that I would need from a zero trust access solution. It gives you split tunneling by default. You can have two-factor authentication, and you can have fine-grained control of access to all your resources. So in a moment here, I'm gonna show you my lab setup and how you can get started with TwinGate. Uh, but before we do that, let's uh, diagram out what the TwinGate solution looks like and how network access is achieved. Now to get a basic TwinGate setup going, you only really need to understand three components. You have the client, the connector, and the controller. So the client is exactly what it sounds like. This is just client software running the TwinGate client that you install on your end devices like your desktop, your laptops, phones, and tablets. So they have versions for iOS and Android, Windows, Mac OS. So basically any type of operating system it's going to be able to run on and your devices use this to connect up with your connectors. Now what the connectors do is actually give access to your different networks. So each of your individual networks, you're gonna want at least two connectors running, and this is for high availability. Now deploying a connector is really, really simple. All you have to do is start a Docker container. So if you have Docker running on your host, such as a Raspberry Pi or a Linux server, it's a simple Docker run command. Now there's other ways to get a connector running. You can use an AMI image, or if you're using a Kubernetes cluster, you can use a Helm chart. Finally, we have the controller, which is managed by TwinGate. And all you need to do to get this component up and running is create an account on TwinGate. So creating an account is free for up to five users and 10 networks. So everything I do in this lab is completely free. And from within the TwinGate console is how you actually configure all your different networks, all your different resources, and all the different users and groups that have access to those resources resources, as well as your devices. So let's go ahead and jump into the TwinGate console on my account, and I'll show you how I have everything set up. And I think this is gonna be the best way for you to learn how you can implement TwinGate into your environment. All right, so we're in the TwinGate console here, and this is what my network setup looks like. So you can see on the very right-hand side, I have all my different remote networks, and in the very middle, I have all the different resources that I'm restricting access to that are spread across my different networks. So you can see on the right-hand side, I have networks such as an AWS production account, a home lab, I have a Kubernetes cluster, and then I have another cloud account that is hosting my production web servers. So these are all different networks, and all I had to do to make a connection to them was deploy the TwinGate connector. Now there's many different options on how to do this. Uh, for AWS, you can use like an AMI, or you can just spin up a Docker container on an existing instance. For my home lab, I just hopped onto my NAS server, as well as a Raspberry Pi, and I deployed a Docker container that way. And for my Kubernetes cluster, I actually deployed a Helm chart. So those are the remote networks. 
What I want to talk about is the resources. So you can see here that I have quite a few different resources spread across all my different networks. So you can actually view this as a list and it's a little easier to see. So I'm going to do that here. And you can see I have all these different resources. So having a look at my resources here, you can see it gives a resource name, it gives an address, and the remote network that it's on, as well as the last time that the resource was accessed. So viewing this, sometimes I like to just uh, choose the remote network. And you can see these are all the services running on my home lab. These are the ones running on my Kubernetes cluster. And then this is my production web server. And then at the very top, I have my resources on AWS. Now there's a couple different ways of how you can control access. So you can do it to a single IP address. You can do it to like a subnet or range of IP addresses, or you can do it based on a domain name. So you can see that I have quite a few different resources where I specifically give the domain name, but you can also do a wildcard. So doing a wildcard gives you flexibility to control access to multiple resources. You can see for my AWS account, I just have star.awsdevopsbrad.com. Of course, you need some sort of name resolution on your DNS servers to make this work. Uh, but I have that set up for my AWS account. I'll go into how I set this up for Kubernetes and you can copy my pattern. It actually works quite well. Uh, but before I do that, let's go ahead and have a look at one of these resources. So I'm just gonna choose my Plex IP here. So this is my Plex server. This is how I can host some content locally and then watch it uh, on my TV or my tablet, no matter where I am. So you can see for my Plex server, I have it connected to my home lab. I'm locking down the ports. These are the ports that the Plex server uses. And then you can see who's been accessing it. So I was uh, watching some TV earlier. So these are all the connection requests and you can actually go into it and you can see all the details of the connection. So this is really good for logging and monitoring who's accessing your network. Now, one thing you may notice is the access I have here is for everyone. So you should probably not use the everyone group for most of your resources. You should be locking it down to groups. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove the everyone user. And then I'm going to add access. And then I already have this Plex users group set up. And I'm going to add that here. So just like that, you're able to control who has access to this resource. Now I'm going to go through more of my resources and how I control access to them, such as my Kubernetes cluster. But before I do that, let's just go ahead and add a resource together, as a lot of you are going to be setting this up for yourself. And uh, I just want to give a quick walkthrough of that. So just go ahead and add a resource and then give it a name. This is just a descriptive name for your resource. So I have a Grafana server, so I'm just going to call it Grafana. And then you can put in either the IP address, the IP address range or a domain name. So you'll need DNS resolution to, in order for the domain name to work. I do have DNS resolution on my home network for this server. And that DNS name is grafana.devopsbrad.com. So this is just local DNS resolution on my network. So anyone outside of my network will not be able to access this IP. You'll need access to my home network. And the way that you get access is through TwinGate. Now you can also lock down which ports are actually open. So it's a best practice to not only restrict access to the actual resource, IP address, or DNS name, but to actually restrict which ports are open. So my Grafana server is set up to listen on the TLS port of 443. So I'm just going to go 443, and we don't need UDP. That looks good. Uh, the one thing I'm missing here is the remote network. So you need to tell TwinGate which remote network this is on. So Grafana is hosted on my home lab, so I'm gonna choose home lab. Once that's done, I'm gonna hit create resource and you can see that it's now asking me to add which users need access to it. So I'm gonna go ahead and say my developers need access to it, my network admins, and then my operations team. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add these groups. Once that's done, you should see it come up and it looks like it's right there. 
and now my users should be able to access that Grafana server. Let's go ahead and have a look if I can access it from my laptop. All right, so I'm connected to my laptop now. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to my Twingate client and all my different resources are here. So I can actually go here and I can just copy the IP address. I could type this manually, but I'm a little bit lazy. So this is one cool feature that I like about the Twingate is you can just copy it from there and then paste it in. And you can see that I have access to my Grafana server. So that's how easy it is to set up access to your specific resources using Twingate. All right, so we're back in the Twingate platform. Let's have a look at all the different settings that you can go through here. So very quickly, we have this team tab, and in the team tab, you have all the things that you would expect. You have your users that you can set up, you have your groups that you can put those users in, and then you also have a tab for service accounts. Now, if you're wondering what a service account is, basically it's an account for one of your services. So if you have some sort of automation server, like a CI, CD pipeline server, like a Jenkins server, you could add a service account and you could have that server use the service account. So that's the team tab. Uh, it's pretty simple to understand. Basically, you just manage your users and groups there. After that, we have devices as well as policies. So if you go to devices, you can see all the different devices that have connected to your network. So you can see that I have my mobile phone, my tablet, as well as a desktop and a few other devices that have connected to my network. Now you have a few different options here. You could verify the device or block the device. Another thing you can do is go to the security tab and these are the trusted profiles. So I don't have any trusted profiles set up, but basically, I have a policy set up for the types of devices that can connect to my network. So you can see that the minimum OS requirements uh, for Windows is that they have a firewall enabled and antivirus enabled. And then if I scroll down for Android, I make it so you need to have your screen lock enabled if you want to access my network using Twingate on an Android device. So the way that you set up the security posture profiles is under policies. So if you go to policies, you can see I have a default policy and this is where I actually manage all those different rules. So right now my network says any device that a user is using, as long as it meets the device security requirements, then it is allowed to connect. Now, if you want your network to be a lot more secure, and only allow trusted devices, then you could enable this. But before you do that, you'll need to make sure to set up a trusted profile. So there's plenty of documentation on how you can set this up. I won't go through this in this tutorial because your needs are gonna be different from my needs. Let's now go to the settings tab. So if we go to the settings tab, you can see that Twingate can actually integrate with quite a few different providers. So if you go to identity providers, you can set it up to integrate with things like Okta or Google Workspace, Azure Active Directory, and even one login. So if you have user accounts using these identity providers, you just set up Twingate to connect to them, and that's how you can get your users to authorize. So if you go to device integrations, you can see that it can integrate with a lot of different MDM and EDR providers. You have access to CrowdStrike, Jamf, Kanji, if you're in an IT team that provisions devices, this is gonna be very important to you. Now, this is just my home network, so I don't need any of this extra security stuff. Just wanted everyone to be aware that this is available. There's one more option that I wanna show here, which is secure DNS, which is DNS over HTTPS. So by default, DNS queries are not encrypted. So anyone snooping a network can see all the different domains that you're going to, unless you're using something like DNS over for HTTPS. So if you want to get this enabled, it's very simple to do. All you need to do is hit enable, and from then on, all your DNS queries from your clients using Twingate are gonna be encrypted. 
All right, so in this section of the video, I'm going to describe how you can set up TwinGate to give you access to your applications inside your Kubernetes cluster. Now, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you've probably run into the problem before where you've deployed an application to it, but getting access to that application is a little bit complicated. Usually you have to set up something like an ingress or you have to use a kube control proxy just to get access to an application that you deployed. If you're using something like TwinGate, what you can do is deploy a connector to your Kubernetes cluster, and then you'll basically be able to control access to all the applications within your cluster. So I really like TwinGate as a solution to get access to my resources in Kubernetes. So the way that I have this set up is you just create a remote network, and I already have one created here, and I just called it Kubernetes, and then I set up two connectors. And basically all I had to do was copy and paste the Helm chart that TwinGate provided and apply that to my Kubernetes cluster. Once that was completed, I then had two connectors connected to my Kubernetes cluster connected as pods. Now, if you look in the middle here, you can see all the different resources that I'm providing access to. So there's two different strategies that I use to provide access to the applications in my Kubernetes cluster. The first method is by using the fully qualified domain name of the actual resource. And the second is to actually just open up an entire namespace. So you can see these top two resources, uh, they're locked down to a specific application. I'm locking down Argo CD and Prometheus. And then at the bottom, I have two wildcard resources for the development namespace and the production namespace. So the way that this works is just by utilizing the internal fully qualified domain names of your Kubernetes resources. So the way that this breaks down is the very far left is the actual Kubernetes resource. After that, you have the namespace and then at the very end, it always ends in dot service dot cluster dot local. If we have a look at the development namespace and production namespace, I've given access to these entire namespaces just by going star for the actual resource name and then saying dot development dot service dot cluster dot local. So let's go into one of these resources and you can see all the activity that has been happening. So for the access, I'm restricting it to my network admins and my operations team for my production namespace. And you can see that recently I connected to portainer.production.service.cluster.local. Now, since this is using a wildcard mask, any new application that I add into my production namespace, I'm automatically going to get access to. So I'm just going to demonstrate this right now. Let's go in and access Jenkins, which I just recently deployed to my production namespace. So I'm just going to paste a URL that I have here. And you can see it's Jenkins.production.service.cluster.local. And uh, Jenkins by default listens on port 8080. So if we go there, you can see that we have access to it. And if we have a look back at our TwinGate console, you can see that we've accessed Jenkins using TwinGate. All right, so that's actually all I wanted to show on how you can set up zero trust access. If you have any questions about anything I went over in the video, please feel free to leave them down below and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.